that's nice. Sorry, just replying to the song there. Uh, yeah, Radio Blog 13, hello. Only a day after Radio Blog 12, so yeah, very quick. Anyway, yeah, we've got quite, um, quite a good blog today. We've got um, more video blog, more footage of a Halloween party. Nick will be there. Um, more heralds and a new um, a new section to radio blog, a film review, and I'll be starting with two scariest films. Anyway, without further ado, I'm going to cut to the party. Is it Hancock? Hello, yeah, Halloween. Hello. Well, I'll see you later. Oh, what? Oh, ha, 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 ha,
the second and final film I'm going to be reviewing is more of a B movie. It's called The House That Dripped Blood. It's a 70s hammer horror film by Amicus. And now it's a it's about um and and it's it's about a couple who go missing, a man who goes missing, and he's been staying in his house. So this investigator goes to this to the policeman and he's finding out all about this house, and we find out about it as well through stories, you know, or different stories. It's a very good film. It turns out towards the end in the vampire bit, the director, I think it was the director, even said this on the commentary. It turns out more of a comedy than a horror, really, then because it's so cheap. It stars John Pertwee and um. Christopher Lee, Peter Cushing, um, Den Elliott, loads of different, um, loads of famous people. Um, so yeah, if you did get to, if you did get a chance to see it, it's very, it's it's quite rare because you know it's a B movie. But if you do get the chance, I'd try and watch it. So yeah, the house that dripped blood. Good at, uh, well, not I was gonna say good acting, but it's not really because that's what makes it more funny. It's kind of rubbish acting, but yeah, goodish acting good script and good story and all that and um yeah so the house of drip blood from me gets um a high seven out of ten so yeah anyway now i'm gonna go on to the heralds enjoy unexpectedly a huge sadness permeated me and the whole corridor seemed steeped in what i could only describe as desperate and inconsolable sorrow such an emotion being just 12 years old and never having experienced anything excruciating was a huge shock making me feel almost ill I knew this emotion was not part of me, although I was very much experiencing it first hand, being somehow conveyed by the boy. He seemed to have found a way of making me feel what he was feeling, in a kind of symbiosis. A link was forming between us which I was not able to control or detach myself from. By then I was feeling physically sick and I noticed my clothes were also drenched in sweat, thus increasing my discomfort. Looking closer beyond his red, wasted eye bags, I could now see his eyes more clearly. It was then I perceived something which no other boy I met or will ever meet could ever convey with that same intensity, an unusual kind of malice, so very powerfully channelled at me, that I did feel that some harm would invariably befall me. Up to that moment the figure had been partly shrouded in the shades and darkness of the corridor. Now he seemed more aligned with one of the windows at my shoulders, through which the moonlight was shining. I realised that it had been advancing closer to me without with my not even noticing. A rusty, feverish kind of breath reached my nostrils. It was about to speak when a trembling voice echoed from the same classroom, uttered from someone in an apparent state of distress and pain. The boy's face to turned towards the door, in a contorted expression of rage and annoyance, and then faced me again, looking all the more evil and menacing. With the little strength I had left, I cried, "'Who's, who's there?' So yeah, that is the end of my Halloween vlog. Um, thank you for tuning in, everyone. And um, I'll see you next week. Goodbye. Was that the door? Oh. Come in. Uh, who are you? Get out of my room. No, d put that knife down. Look, go away. No, don't you. Uh, don't you. No, no, please. No, no. Uh.